Hi, this is Guillermo Sanchez, CEO of Publitas.com, and you're listening to the Conversion Aid Podcast. Welcome to the Conversion Aid Podcast, where we help software entrepreneurs to take their business to the next level. Each week, we interview proven industry experts who share their strategies and insights to help you create software that sells. Here's your host, Omer Khan. Hey everyone, welcome to the Conversion Aid Podcast. I'm your host, Omar Khan, and this is the podcast for software entrepreneurs and companies who want to grow their business to the next level and create software that sells. Now, before I introduce today's guest, I want to ask you a question. Is there someone that you'd like me to interview on this podcast? Is there a person, product, or story that you want to hear more about? I'd love to hear from you. Just send me a tweet at Omer Khan, O-M-E-R-K-H-A-N, and I will do my best to get that person on the show. All right. Today's interview is with Guillermo Sanchez. Guillermo is the co-founder and CEO of Publitas, the easiest way to turn your print catalogs and magazines into interactive, shoppable publications on all devices. Guillermo has bootstrapped the business since it was founded in 2006, and currently Publitas has over 600 customers, including many leading retail companies. Guillermo, welcome to the show. Hi, Omar. Thanks. <laughs> Now, I gave the audience a brief overview of your product and business, but tell us a little bit more about you personally. Who is Guillermo when he's not working? Uh, yeah, um, a, a motorcycle aficionado. Uh, and uh, since uh, uh, a short, since six, six months, father of a beautiful son. Congratulations. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Those are my, uh, together with my wife, are my main uh, op- uh, occupations uh, outside work nowadays. Okay, and you're, you're currently in the Netherlands, right? Yeah, we're uh, actually based in Amsterdam, uh, okay. in the uh, beautiful city of Amsterdam, in the city center, uh, in between the canals. Very nice. Now, we like to kick things off with a success quote to better understand what drives and motivates our guests. What is one of your favorite quotes? Um, as you've probably heard from my uh, name, uh, my roots lie in Spain. So I'm uh, originally Spanish and uh, in normally uh, that means that I, genetically I'm not very structured always. <laughs> Let's say uh, my precondition. So um, some years ago I read a quote from uh, Eisenhower. I think it, I believe it was uh, uh, MacArthur or Eisenhower, one of the things. He said, "When let's say going uh, uh, to war, uh, plans are worthless, but it was the planning that was indispensable." So, uh, and the thing is, uh, you know, I don't like to operate with very strict plans, but uh, that gives me some uh, comfort uh, in in that thought that I try to uh, plan as much as possible, but then accept that uh, in chaos uh, I will find my way. And, and so is is that kind of uh, reflective of the way that you've built this business? Uh, yeah, in, in to a certain extent, I think so. So we I, <clears throat> actually, uh, the idea for this company uh, originated uh, all together with a uh, former uh, college buddy uh, on a Friday evening uh, in the pub, uh, drinking a beer. And uh, Monday... Uh, that's, not why, that's not why it's called Publitas, right? No, no, no. Actually, that's a very good coincidence. Maybe we should add that story, but in this case, no. No, we needed a, a name that sounded, uh, we wanted a dot com domain that sounded good and, uh, it was quite tricky and something with publishing. So, uh, but uh, actually we, uh, we had some ideas and, um, he is uh, very good with, uh, uh, yeah, fiddling with technology and literally, um, uh, the next Monday I quit my job. So, wow. Uh, yeah, that was how much planning we put into the into the business. Wow. Okay, so let's start by um, giving our listeners a better understanding of exactly what Publitas is. Who are your target customers, and what are the top pain points that you're trying to solve for them? Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, we've developed um, a publishing uh, platform, or you could say uh, that enables you to take, uh, f- for example, a PDF and create a, a very nice online catalog uh, that's shoppable, completely responsive on mobile devices that looks re- uh, works really well. So um, our biggest and most important customers are uh, mainly retail companies. So, uh, for example. 
in the US, um, uh, that might be companies like Home Depot that have um, uh, weekly ads or catalogs uh, that they want to um, make uh, shoppable and accessible uh, on mobile devices. Um, so uh, next to that, nowadays, we also have um, uh, freemium versions of uh, our application, and those are used uh, by yeah, almost all kinds of business. We have cust- hospitals uh, that you want to publish brochures or... Uh, this could be, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, schools. Uh, uh, actually, we have uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, segments uh, in our uh, customer list. But let's say a very important customer for us are retail companies. Um, and here in Europe, we, uh, 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 let's say we work, uh, yeah, with almost uh, all leading companies. Um, and in countries like we originated in, uh, in the Netherlands, where we have almost, uh, we work for 70% of all nationally operating retail companies. Wow. Okay, so uh, t- tell me a little bit more about where the idea came from. So you you and a, and a friend were in a pub. Um, what, what was the problem that you guys started talking about that you wanted to solve? Yeah, so... Um, uh, me and uh, Khalil, who is uh, my co- uh, co-founder, um, uh, yeah, we know each other. Uh, we've n- known each other for years. Uh, um, yeah, Khalil basically had developed a new technology to uh, publish uh, PDFs online. So it was still still very early stage. So we came together, had a beer on Friday, like we uh, uh, we were used to uh, having once in a while. Um, I was working as a consultant uh, uh, for Deloitte <clears throat> after uh, uh, graduating uh, college and I did that for a couple of years. So we got together and he showed it to me and uh, he uh, asked me, you know, what, uh, you know, what do you think about the technology? Ba- basically, even from the technology part, you know. Uh, so um, I myself had, you know, always I've been selling um uh, yeah, stuff since I was four years old. I started selling uh, when I was uh, four years old. I was sending, uh, let's say, my uh, 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 pencils and pens in the classroom to uh, classmates. So I always had uh, a passion for entrepreneurship. So uh, after being uh, at Deloitte for some time, I thought, you know, I was looking around and thinking, you know, is there something that uh, you know that I could get involved in? So when we were, while we were having that meeting, he showed me the. Um, the technology, and he said, "You know, do you think that we could make a, make a product out of this?" And and yeah, I you know we talked about it, and I thought, you know, I think it would be this technology would be nice. Yeah, I was a consultant, so um, uh, I had to carry around uh, a lot of uh, let's say tr- uh, trade journals where you you know uh, you have to read up on, uh, for example, uh, uh, I was uh, in compliance uh, back then, financial compliance. So uh, you got these uh, trade magazines, uh, professional magazines that you had to read and sign. So I would do a lot of international work, and I was always carrying this uh, uh, bag, you know, full of these things on the plane and everything to read up uh, on all the current events uh, in between. So I thought, you know... uh, why not create a platform for digital uh, magazines where you can um, yeah, uh, access all these magazines digitally on your laptop um, instead of carrying uh, all this paper around? So, um, yeah, and that's how, basically how we got started. So we developed this platform uh, for professional publishers and, uh, yeah, and then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, got started. So what was it about what you saw? Is, is, by the way, is Khalil still involved in the business today? Yeah. Yes, yeah. He's, uh... Okay. So what was it about the technology that you saw which convinced you to quit your job the next week? It, to be real honest, it was not the technology <laughs> because there was very little. There was almost nothing. For me, the, what convinced me to quit my job was like, you know, uh, um, yeah, uh, I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to, uh, to be an entrepreneur. So, and, uh, 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 at that point I had no, 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 uh, no children. I, uh, was not living in a very expensive house still, was not uh, driving a, two, a car that was too expensive. You know, what they call the, here in the Netherlands, we call that, the, uh, we, I was not in a golden cage. So I thought, you know, before I am, I just need to do this. I need to get this out of my system and actually, uh, you know, I, 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 at that point, I didn't even care what uh, the possibility was. I just wanted, I was motivated to do it. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, that's why um, 
uh, yeah, there were, we had a nice idea. It seemed like we could do something with that. And we, you know, we just thought there's one way of finding it out, uh, just doing it. And did, did Khalil, uh, quit his job as well or? What was yeah, he was, <clears throat> yeah, he was actually, uh, uh, finishing his, uh, he was still, uh, uh, in college. So, uh, basically, uh, uh, yeah, for him, it was more easy to transition in, into that. So, uh, that's why, uh, yeah, we came together and uh, uh, yeah, and started. So we started basically also in our living room um, uh, of uh, uh, let's say uh, an apartment that we rented, and uh, yeah, we we started uh, uh, to try to sell because we we didn't have any funding or something like that. We it was a bit like before here in the Netherlands at least there was an actual like a very good f- also investment uh, ecosystem. So we basically, uh, I had some uh, uh, savings, uh, uh, I had a, uh, so some money uh, in the bank basically, and uh, yeah, uh, we used that to survive. And, how, uh, it w- how, how much of a runway did you have, like based on your savings, how long did you think you could keep going with this before you had to start okay. making money? Okay, <clears throat> this, is, this is a very interesting story. So I, I think, if I remember correctly, I had about... Uh, uh, 20,000 uh, euros, uh, or, uh, in the bank. And so the funny thing is when, once I quit my job, uh, uh, we, uh, I moved apartments, uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to have an apartment where we had a bit more room. So, uh, I made the stupid mistake of, uh, the beginner's mistake of, let's say quitting my job, uh, uh before, uh, let's say leasing the new apartment. <laughs> so of the, of that 20, and you can already start to, uh, to maybe anticipate this of those 20, I thought, you know, we have, we have about the runway of 20,000 euros, you know, um, <clears throat> probably we're using up about 2000 euros or maybe thousand uh, to 2000 euros a month. So, you yeah, know, it gives you 10 months. But um, then what happened when uh, once we rented the new apartment, they said, yeah, but you're unemployed. And I told them, uh, no, we're unemployed. I'm starting, uh, I started a company. Yeah, but uh, do you have uh, three years worth of, uh, profit, of profitable, uh, let's say, um, of pro- uh, your profit of loss statements? What can you show us that you've made a profit, you know, three years consecutively? And I said, no, because we don't exist three years. So they said, okay, the only way that we can rent you the apartment is if you, uh, let's say, uh, pay the rent upfront for one year uh, in a deposit and then pay rent anyhow. So our runway uh got uh, automatically uh let's say uh, reduced to half uh, to 50% uh, because of this uh, unexpected deposit wow so uh, that uh, motivated us uh, even more to uh, to to try to make some money okay so so you guys you said you quit your job a week later you're working on this business yeah. um what were you trying to sell? I mean, you said there wasn't really there, that, that much there with the technology. So what were you going out and trying to sell to people? Yeah, basically. The, and so what we did is and later on, uh, when I was reading uh, uh, the Lean Startup, it was really funny because then I found out actually that we were very, uh, we always had been naturally uh, working lean out of necessity. So we actually started selling uh, the idea that we had initially as a service. So, we we took that technology of creating like a digital publication and uh we said okay um if you want we want to uh uh, uh we approached some big publishers here in the Netherlands and uh said okay if we can create a digital uh public we can create digital publications for you that enable you to uh, sell uh to yeah to make them available to your customer digital magazines next to your current subscription models um and we'll just do the work for you so we'll deliver you the end product so you don't have to take, uh, yeah, uh, worry about anything, doing the production yourself, etc. So, um, so we started what they call a concierge MVP, and um, yeah, that actually worked uh, very well. Um, and as we grew, uh, we uh, it were our customers actually that helped us define the product and then actually even finance the product and finance basically us. So, so this is how. So, tell me, what do you mean by that? So I mean, with you, you mean by concierge MVP or no? I mean, with how, how did they help finance you? Yeah, because uh, uh, basically we co-developed the product by them by selling it initially as a service, and oh, while we were delivering the service, we were automating the tasks to provide the service, which 
eventually led to the product. And at some point, we even sold them the new product and collected the money before we had even built the product. <laughs> so they basically uh, uh, fronted the money for, to, for us to go and build the product. How, how did you do that? I, I'm sure that there's a lesson here for everybody. Selling. Be creative. I mean, uh, work with your customer. I would say the, the most important thing is first um, to find a customer that has some kind of problem and work with them. Uh, uh, and we still do this today. Um, work with them to genuinely help them solve this problem You know, together. Invest heavily in uh, the relationship and trying to understand them. Um, uh, in trying to really get a, a very a deep uh, insight into uh, their business. And um, then, uh, let's say, uh, once you base, this build, builds an enormous trust. And where there's trust, there's, uh, let's say, uh, people uh, that are uh, ready or able to invest. And uh, that is what leads to customers to, at some point, uh, giving you their money because they know that you're going to solve their problem. Uh, so they, yeah, co, yeah, co-entrepreneur with you almost. Okay, so you you were kind of providing this concierge MVP offering. Um, were you selling it as a service or were you selling it as a product to these customers? No, initially we we were yeah both. So we started as a service service, and uh, as we productized it step by step, we also. Uh, changed our business model, um, uh, let's say, uh, gradually. So yeah. to uh, to a more, yeah, where we're charging more in the form of a product than as a business. So yeah. So to, going back, looking at one of those uh, early customers, what did you say to them, which persuaded them to give you money for something that you weren't able to deliver today? It's like, give me some money and I'll come back with a product sometime in the future. What was that conversation like? How did it go? Well, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's all. I would say it's all about trust. I, I, I see this. We still use this uh, methodology every day. It's about. Um, I mean, you're a, you're always able to invest, but as a startup, probably a lot of times not maybe not in money, but in time and effort. You know, so, and I uh, and uh, the the way that you get a customer to give you, to front you money, to give you money, even if you don't have a product, is to first invest your time and effort in genuinely uh, working with them and trying to understand them. Um, I, I mean, and that's basically, uh, you can do that. That's, that's free, basically. So there's nobody uh, uh, holding you back to, uh, to even providing the, the service that you can or uh, perform yourself free of charge of you know and that's where it starts you know you know i really want you <clears throat> nowadays we say this to customers also you know we want to build this feature sometimes there are features that need research or you know need to be co-developed and sometimes we we uh, might even propose to some our you know we have very big corporate co- customers also that uh, let's say use uh, our standard product but sometimes uh, we even have ideas where we say okay we have this very cool idea. We would really want to test that together with you and learn if this works. Uh, it would be great if you're able to invest with that. You know, if you, I mean, we're gonna put some considerable time in it and build and you know allocate resources. If you would be willing to invest also some money with that, you know, uh, to uh, to make the investment uh, uh, possible, because I mean, we're uh, you know you, uh, that makes gives us more room to invest and. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, we say, you know, if you can, it's great. If you can't, we're going to find a way to do it anyhow and we'll uh, cooperate with you anyhow. So, uh, and, you know, that's openness. I think, you know, when you begin investing uh, before, uh, when you give before you ask, I think, you know, that creates a very strong relationship. That's so, my philosophy at least. So were you giving away equity in the company for this, this investment? No, I was giving a, a time. Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, now you, you you don't have a background in sales, right? You haven't worked as a sales guy. Not not before having worked, uh, let's say, in my own company. No. And and do you think your experience as at Deloitte in a, in a consulting role um, helped you, or do you think this was something that goes back to the days of trying to sell the pencils in the classroom? Yeah. Okay. 
before I started my company, uh, the, the thing is, uh, when I first started Pubitas, um, I had never had a background in sales. So um, uh, my background was in uh, computer science and uh, business administration. And then I work, uh, uh, went to work for, uh, for Deloitte as an international uh, management consultant. So uh, I would say I'm good at solving problems. And I'm good at, I mean, maybe not even solving problems, but working with people and uh, analyzing problems. Uh, so um, what I actually learned by uh, eventually by uh, uh, <clears throat> once I uh, you know started my own business and I had to sell is that actually the best salespeople are those that really understand the problem and can give a solution because that uh, that changes the whole concept of selling right so uh, uh, that means that you know everybody has problems and if you can give a solution you know you don't a lot of times you don't even have to convince somebody to to uh, like. Uh, in the form of slap on sales, you know, like, you know, uh, I'm going to sell you something that you don't need. So, uh, yeah, uh, actually I found out that, uh, uh, I was pretty good at sales. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so that, and that helped us enormously because the, uh, we financed our growth completely from, uh, 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 let's say from sales. We've never taken basically money from anybody. So, so somebody who's listening to this saying, I know I need to sell. I need to, I need to generate sales, but I am, I am just crappy at selling anything, right? So what I'm hearing from you is number one, focus on building trust before you do anything else. Number two, understand those, those customers' problems. And then number two, genuinely try to help find solutions for those problems. Yeah, a- I think, yeah, in terms of coming back to the quotes part, I think one of the th- b- most important realizations, I think, you don't sell to people. You make them want to buy. And I think if you, if you uh, why, uh, and that's what I, you know, what we also use as a guideline here, because uh, that's a very fundamental, different way of looking at the situation. You know, when you make uh, when you uh, make somebody want to buy, uh, that means that you have to have a genuine solution. You have to have a good product or put effort into making the product better, to understanding, you know, to working in just continuously improving that. And at some point, what happens is, you know, uh, it, selling becomes very easy. Like it's just bringing. For example, uh, your product in, onto the attention of your potential customers, right? So, uh, yeah. And I think that for every entrepreneur, um, uh, I think that that's where basically what it begins. You know, just put the effort in, jump. Uh, and nowadays, I mean, uh, again, after reading uh, uh, The Lean Startup, and uh, we're like crazy uh, about uh, working lean here. That means that, you know... Um, let's say, uh, uh, spend time with your potential customers, spend time with people that you want to help and, you know, start helping them without even building a product. And uh, then la- once you understand uh, what your problem that you're solving, how much, uh, uh, you know, what kind of worth that problem has, you know, you can work back towards productizing. And then it's actually not that easy. You know, the world is filled with problems that need to be solved. So, there's no shortage, short, uh, shortage of that. So uh, there's actually abundance of problems. So, Okay, so how long did it take you to get that first sale? Um, actually, I think probably in the first month or something. So uh, in the first month, uh, again, we were very much, we were very motivated after the shock that we've just lost 50% of our own weight. <laughs> <laughs> so actually for me that was like holy crap what 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 just what what happened what hit us which was hit us so uh that that really like you know uh put us to work and um i started <clears throat> i had no idea where to start again so uh i've done everything you know when we started we scraped emails we yeah I would say we we sent like something that would probably consider, be considered a bit spammy email. We did everything that we could do, you know, to learn. We just thought, you know, let's try it. You know, uh, I mean, we don't we don't want to break any laws or something, but everything that's permitted, let's just do it. You know, at some point, we even you know talk about uh, thought about you know, shall we call companies from the yellow pages? You know, we just you know, let's just 
And the thing is, when you, uh, and again, going back from Lean, when you, I mean, there are obviously, nowadays, you know, you have an, uh, great resources that will help you um, conceptualize a lot of things much faster. So I really believe, you know, just get started and then, you know, start, start um, learning as fast as possible as you can. But, uh, you know, when we started a couple of years ago, again, you know, you, you didn't have like uh, resources like Quora. You know, Quora is like gold, you know. You want to sell a SaaS business to business product, you go on Quora, uh, um, follow the right people, and you will get a very good idea of where to start. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, but for us, it was the first month. And uh, you, like a lot of companies, you know, just start contacting, reaching out, selling. You know, uh, we, st- we started just before LinkedIn was really popular, which is, I think, a very powerful business tool. So for us, it was just, you know, Googling somebody, uh, Googling who is responsible for, you know, uh, uh, at the publishers and just uh, uh, finding a way to getting them on the phone. And uh, we just did. Looking back at that first year, what do you think was one of the biggest mistakes that you made? Yeah, I think um, the biggest mistakes um, uh, for us, I mean, uh, I would say um, not realizing that we were a product company and a technology company. So at some point, um, so we were delivering a software platform and um uh so basically that makes you a technology company but uh like like i said myself i was very sales oriented so uh at some at some point so you you sometimes you forget how imp- let's say how powerful it is to have very good people on board for example that can build all these ideas that you have like really you know in a in a exceptional way so what we did initially, we started investing too much in sales initially uh, instead of in- investing, for example, more into the product and making a better product and building out a better team. So, yeah, and that eventually caught up with us. Um, uh, yeah, at some point it, it, uh, it catches up with you that you, for example, that a cert- there are certain markets started to grow and we started to get competitors that were uh, developing much faster than we, than, uh, we would do. So, uh, yeah, that was a, an important lesson. Um, another lesson, I think, for me was also, and I'm, I'm trying to apply this nowadays, is think bigger. Um, I mean, the good thing about working lean is, you know, just get started. But sometimes you get so so uh, trapped in uh, the incremental improvements that you forget, you know, to really step out and think, you know, um, how do I really, for example, in our case, you know, how do we uh, pivot this company to a, a, a billion uh, dollars uh, a year revenue company, which I think you can do. But the thing is, uh, if you don't have, if you're too busy, like uh, um, if you don't create the time, you know, to also uh, zoom out. Yeah, you sometimes you go on uh, incrementally. Uh, you could say, uh, uh, let's say, premature optimization. Right. So these are the things I think that, uh, yeah, I realized that I could have done better. Okay, so you you started selling, you started getting customers, and then you started investing in in building the product. At what point do you feel that you started to get some meaningful traction with the business? I mean, yeah, with us, traction went uh, in two stages. Like, uh, so initially we bu- we built our product. Uh, okay, initially, so we started selling it as a concierge MVP, and idea was to create a digital pub- uh, digital magazine platform for publishers <clears throat> for uh, and specifically professional uh, publishers slash trade publishers you know the the guys that make uh, the magazine for example for uh, you know um, uh, auditors or you know the, the, so okay um, so the the what we did is uh, we started um, uh, we approached some very big uh, uh, publishers and said, "Okay, we're going to help you make the transition to digital, and we're going to uh, we're going to create a product for you that's uh, going to enable you to." And uh, yeah, this was just to create some context. This was just before the launch of the iPad, so we were a bit too early because actually all the ideas that we have nowadays, you know, if you go to a, uh, an iBooks uh, uh, application of or where, where actually Amazon is doing, uh, we had that like six years ago, like. So, but, uh, so we started with the publishers and then we noticed two things. One is 
that actually the publishers were not very interested in the internet. <laughs> uh, and this is really funny. So, be, uh, because their business model was mainly um, based on moving paper, I will say. So they were earning their money not specifically by somebody reading the magazine, but more by putting it in your mailbox. And this whole digital thing was actually uh, more a threat at that point than it was like a, a profit um, because it was very uh, profit maker. It was very transparent. So the, uh, the advertisers would ask, you know, tell us about the readership and those numbers would be lower uh, than in, uh, in reality what they were reporting. So this is one thing. So, and next, so we found out at some point that even though the idea was good, so it was very difficult to scale it uh, to an uh, extent where you can get a, you know, a viable company over time. You want to hit certain growth rates. And uh, later on, I've uh, learned uh, in an interesting, uh, you know, Paul Graham uh, of Y Combinator writes a, a lot about this, that you know that you have traction where you, when you're uh, growing on a weekly base uh, between 5 to 15%. You, then you have product market fit. You have achieved product market fit. So this is a very interesting case where you see that, okay, there's a customer, there's a customer willing to pay, but you're not getting the growth rates. So at some point we said, okay, I mean, this is actually not going anywhere. Uh, not, not, you know, this is not a company. I mean, we want to, we want to cr- grow, uh, uh, yeah, b- uh, become bigger. So that's when we decided to step back and look at, okay, you know, are there other customers that might, have use for this technology. And um, actually at that moment we were approached by a retail company uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, like uh, you could say uh, the, the, uh, the European equivalent of Walmart that was interested in the technology um, for the exact, exact uh, opposite reason that the publishers were not uh, interested. Uh, we, uh, let's say the engine that we developed uh, to publish uh, the magazines uh, enabled you to completely uh, analyze who was reading which products on which page for how long, etc. Which at that point it was fairly new because it was based in Flash, and uh, uh, yeah, Flash was this like this closed system, and nobody yeah could see inside. So we had developed that thinking that it was would be neat for advertisers, but uh, actually uh, the advertise uh, the the publishers uh, yeah they were not happy with that transparency. But the retailer actually was uh, was very excited because uh, for the first time it enabled them to publish their uh, weekly ads and get insights into how customers were uh, going through the, uh, the weekly ads and the promotional catalogs. So, uh, yeah, we did a trial with them and actually realized that even though that that was not the most obvious place for us to start, you know, when we uh, launched the product, that the, the product market fit and the value for them was many times bigger than actually the, the, the publisher at that point. So in this... Is actually when uh, we uh, when we did a pivot. Uh, okay, so we this customer was a, a bit by accident. We realized by talking to the customer that the value was actually much higher. So then we started talking to other customer uh, to other uh, retail companies, and uh, uh, so we basically transitioned the same product. We kept the product the same. So they said, okay, we're not going to sell it to resell uh, to retailers, and. Um, yeah, then we saw the, uh, that we yeah, grew very fast in the Netherlands initially. Uh, and uh, at that point, we said, okay, now, it's, now that we know that we really have traction, uh, we decided to do a rebuild of the product. And so, and, you know, geared to, towards that market. What so, do you think would have happened if you hadn't refocused the business on retailers back then and continued yeah. with publishers? I mean, I think... Uh, we would probably be uh, would not exist today. Uh, uh, yeah, so because the, the business was not growing and there, it was stagnating, stagnating, and yeah, at some point uh, the thing is, and that's what I. That's also quite interesting. Like for example, at that point for publishers, um, two things could have happened. One is we would have been uh, out of business. Uh, the reason why is, um, uh, uh, and this is very interesting also for entrepreneurs. A lot of the times you see that uh, you have, uh, I think it's Gartner that has this, what they call the hype cycle, right? So, um, so a lot of things, um, uh, initially the, the reasons for, uh, for companies, uh, you know, to try certain technologies 
uh, are not always because they think that this is a good structural thing to do. So it's more because they're looking, you know, there's this new technology, um, and that, and they're, they're, they are unsure of how this is going to fit within their business. And I, just to give an example, maybe, you know, in retail, you have something like they call narrow casting where the screens in, uh, in stores. So this technology, a couple of years, you know, hit the market and you, there was like, you know, narrow casting was everywhere. You know, you had screens everywhere. People were trying stuff, but, um, uh, a friend of mine also told me, you know, uh, this was being financed from budgets, uh, innovation, innovation budgets. So because the companies didn't know exactly, you know, what, you know, how are we going to use this new, uh, channel and we're still learning and do we need to do something? But what happens at some point, they understand, they figure it out. And so, uh, it moves away from the realm of, you know, innovation budget towards, you know, actual uh let's say allocated budget for this channel and this being a part of your channel mix so what happens is um, that means if you as a company are not solving a problem that is structurally a problem that's going to be solved you know so the hype if you don't if there's not a way to move uh, this uh let's say through the hype cycle what happens is your business ends so for us <clears throat> the digital magazine th- uh, thing you know I think we were too early in, in the business to survive the hype cycle because they would have rather have killed it. But, uh, so we probably would have died before the iPad has, had, uh, let's say, uh, taken off. Or maybe not, we'll never know. But, um, certainly we noticed that, yeah, I mean, uh, that, uh, uh, we were in the innovation, uh, yeah, stage. So we noticed that you, you, were, you were not getting the repetitive business that we would like to have. So let's talk about the business today. How, how much revenue do you guys do in 2014? Yeah, we're close to uh, 2 million euros a year. Okay. Which is uh, in terms of dollars? Yearly, yearly current. Yeah. Okay. Dollar value d- depends, I think, <laughs> on uh, what the do- We actually don't look too much <laughs> at what the dollar is doing, but I think right now it's probably somewhere like uh, 1.20. Uh, so that would be uh, around uh, uh yeah, two two and a half million uh, dollars uh, oh. of yearly recurring revenue. And and how how are you guys tracking for this year? Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, let's say our next goal is to grow to uh, ten million um, recurring. And I actually don't care if it's dollar or euros, but ten million <laughs> yearly recurring revenue. The reason why is, and uh, I follow uh, uh, this very good VC and entrepreneur, uh, Jason Lemkin, um, who uh, of Storm Ventures, I think, and he says, you know, from zero to one million is impossible. From one million to ten million is unlikely, I think, and from ten million to a hundred million is in- inevitable. So that's the next step to become a micro brand. So yeah, we've rebuilt our platform. We are getting this revenue mainly of European markets with a, a very big market share in the Netherlands. And now actually we're rolling out internationally. It's going very well. So we're ha- uh, getting customers in the US, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mexico, Canada, uh, yeah, uh, Turkey. So uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so we hope to uh, hit the, the 10 million uh, within the two, uh, within two years. That's uh, our. Uh, um, our goal. We're aiming to at least get 100 percent, 50, 150 uh, percent growth uh, year on year. Wow! <clears throat> now, some people would look at the the print business and the publishers that you were going after and say, "Okay, that was probably a smart move, right?" I mean, that industry we know is in decline anyway, and if they're not embracing online, they're going to have a problem. But I think even if you look at retailers, publishing is becoming easier and easier, right? So so do you foresee this time where these publishers won't need to take the step to go to a PDF to then go to publish something, and they'll already have the tools to be able to go directly and publish this stuff themselves? and. Yeah. As that happens, how do you see the role of Publitas? Yeah, uh, here you go. And that's what I mean uh, with continuously pivoting and reinventing yourself. We're helping develop, the, the, we're now, as we speak, helping them develop those tools uh, together uh, that they're going to use. Uh, so, uh, again, like we did when we started. 
So uh, only we're now doing it with the trust and uh, the yeah the the relation and even you know the funding uh, that they're providing us to take that next step. So yeah, so what I'm trying to say is we are always inventing our next product together with our customers. So what we're selling today is not we know that that's not the reality uh, in uh, in two years. So. Where we want to be to, in two years, we're actually now developing together already with our customers. Got it, got it. And uh, how big is the business today? How many people do you have working there? We're actually uh, quite small. Uh, uh, so uh, at this moment, we're nine people. Wow. Yeah, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, our platform services about 20 million uh, unique visitors each month. We're almost, uh, let's say, present in all the uh, geographies. Uh, we have customers in China. We, we have a lot of traffic in China, uh, U.S., uh, South America, South Africa. And, uh, yeah, uh, we do that with uh, a very uh, small team, but very, uh, let's say, well-organized. That's also part of our, uh, eventually, about our, uh, let's say, philosophy. So we try to hire for quality, not for quantity. Got it. All right, Guillermo, it's now time for our lightning round. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'd like you to answer them as quickly as you can. Are you ready? Yeah. What's the best piece of business advice that you ever received? Cash is king. (laughs) (laughs) What book would you recommend to our audience and why? Oh, that's 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 actually a very tricky one. Uh, the lean startup, I would say. What's one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful entrepreneur? Uh, perseverance. What's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Asana. If you had to start over tomorrow, what type of business would you go out and build? If you would ask me this 10 years ago, I would say electric cars. <laughs> I love electric cars. <laughs> uh, I'm very jealous of uh, Elon now. But uh, no, um, yeah, uh, my passion lies actually in um, nutrition and healthcare also. So I, I, I'd say... So, or something with learning. That's uh, um, cool. What's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? Wow. Yeah, that that I cannot stand still. I mean, that <laughs> people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, people know that they they're always imitating me here at the office. Like. Uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, actually, and what people don't know, I, I actually, that, that I wouldn't know, uh, actually. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what is one of your most important passions outside of your work? Uh, I would say uh, learning. Like, you know, uh, I, I love to learn. Le- yeah, learn, I mean, I, I need, my brain... I notice if I don't learn, if uh, I, I become very unhappy. So I would say that's my second biggest passion. Awesome. Guillermo, I want to thank you for joining me today and, and sharing your experiences and insights with our audience. And thank you for letting us get to know you a little better personally as well. Now, if folks want to find out more about Publitas or they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? I mean, uh, you can uh, uh, tweet me. I'm on um, I'm on Twitter, uh, Guillermo Sanchez, or LinkedIn. Um, I think I even have. I mean, any channel that you can find me on, just uh, ping me, uh, and I will be- uh, get back to you. So, uh, 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 yeah, um, just let me know. Uh, we're happy, especially specifically entrepreneurs. I believe very much in sharing uh, knowledge with each other. Uh, and lessons learned and um, yeah uh, if if uh, somebody uh, wants to reach out yes uh, and if <clears throat> if you do want to publish your PDF obviously or increase your conversion with uh, digital publication 
uh, check out polytest.com. We have a great uh, free version nowadays, so uh, we're getting a lot of compliments about that. Awesome. Guillermo, thanks again, and I wish you continued success. You too. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Guillermo Sanchez of Publitas. You can get to the show notes for this episode by going to conversionaid.com slash 47, where you'll find all the links and resources that we discussed today. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find me on Twitter at Omer Khan, O-M-E-R-K-H-A-N, or you can email me at omer at conversionaid.com. If you enjoyed this episode, then I'd really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to submit a review on iTunes. Just go to conversionaid.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. Thanks for listening to Conversion Aid, the podcast that shows you how to take your business to the next level and create software that sells. But things don't have to end here. Head over to conversionaid.com slash VIP and get yourself on the free VIP list where we share special insider content and news about upcoming episodes. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time.